Hi, I'm Tuan Leners. I'm the Senior Director of Science and Conservation at the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute in Jamestown, New York. And uh, we're here at the College Lodge Preserve, and we're hoping to find some amphibians today. Um, I've been working here for quite a few years, and in the past we've been surveying the, the preserve. And we've been able to find six different types of frogs out here, frogs and toads. And we have five or six different species of salamanders out here. So you never know what you're going to find. It's a little drizzly today. It's still early in the season, but we'll go take a look. Um, most likely what we're going to see will be some of the woodland salamanders. We have redback salamanders, uh, slimy salamanders. We actually have uh, dusky salamanders here as well. Uh, if we're really lucky, we might find some vernal pool species like spotted salamanders, which have already bred by now a month and a half ago. So they probably have left the pools and they're probably on their way out on the ground again. Um, I think you never know. Frogs are out here, green frogs, bullfrogs, spring peepers, toads. So we'll see. Let's go find out and we'll see what we find. They're really, they're, there are two really distinct times at which you see amphibians appear in this area. So you have the early emergence, often when there's still snow on the ground, the vernal pool species will come out, which will include spotted salamanders, wood frogs, um, leopard frogs to some extent as well. They come out really, really early and breed really early before there's any competition. They breed in vernal pools and vernal pools are really, um, temporary wetlands that don't hold water throughout the season, which means that they dry up in the summer and eliminate any kind of fish in there. There's no permanent water, so a lot of predators that would be in permanent water would not be able to survive in a vernal pool, which gives species that breed in there the advantage of not having to worry about predators. But they need a month or a month and a half for this entire larval cycle to complete, so they have to start breeding earlier than other species because if the pool dries up before the larvae can get out, then you know they literally put all their eggs in one basket and they lose everything. So, so you have these early breeders, spotted salamanders, wood frogs, um, leopard frogs a little bit. And then the reason why they start early too is because they hibernate really close to the surface. So they're really, they have, they're, these things have real superpowers. They, they hibernate just below the surface which means that they're above the frost line. So these early breeding amphibians literally freeze solid during the winter. Um, and they can survive being frozen because they actually generate a sort of antifreeze glycoproteins in their blood so that when the water in their blood freezes, it doesn't create ice crystals and destroys the capillaries in the smaller uh, blood vessels. So species that breed early hibernate close to the surface, freeze solid, thaw as soon as it warms up enough and they're in the water and they're out sometimes in March or April. Then everything kind of stops. The vernal pool species will keep developing. And around this time, April, May, when things really start to warm up, the rest of the amphibians will come to the surface, the ones that hibernate deeper down that are below the frost line, so they don't risk freezing solid. And that includes things like green frogs and bullfrogs, um, most of the other amphibian species, really. So at this point, everything should be out. Okay. And we should be able to find at least eggs and tap tadpoles from the earlier breeders in the water, and we might see some evidence of breeding of the later species. Down there, the yeah. orange there's one right there that's walking around, and there's another one right here. So these little guys right here, these are red efts, and they are the terrestrial life stage of a, a salamander called a red spotted newt. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting species because it's kind of unique around here that it's in its own family and it's actually more closely related to like old world European salamanders than it is to all the other salamanders that we have around here. It's kind of the only one of that family here in this area. And what makes them unique is that it's the only salamander in the region here that um, spends its life in the water as an adult. So they actually have fins on their tails and they swim around in the water most of the time. They lay their eggs in the water. The eggs will develop in the water into an aquatic larvae. And when the aquatic larvae grow up and, and go through a metamorphosis to turn into like an adult stage, they turn into this. They turn into these little bright orange little dudes. And they spend some time, a couple of years in most cases, depending on where you are, um, on land. So these are kind of like the teenagers. These are like no longer larvae. They're now on land probably three or four years in this region here. And um, eventually they will get bigger and will go back to the water and then completely change. They'll lose their orange coloration. 
they'll turn green with little red spots on them. They'll grow the fins on their tail and kind of more webbing between your toes and they, they become aquatic and that's where they'll reproduce and eventually die in the water. They won't come back out again. So this is sort of that, that awkward intermediate phase that they're on land. And what is their life cycle? How long is their cycle? So the development from egg to F stage happens within one season. Um, so the adults will be starting to breed pretty soon, probably in the next month or so. Okay. And then they will crawl on land by the end of the summer, early fall. And then I would say around here, we don't really know for sure, but depending on your latitude, they can spend a shorter or longer period of time in the F stage. Okay. So southern latitudes, they'll probably stay orange for maybe two years. The adults of this species tend to hibernate in vernal pool habitats. They tend to breed in permanent water, like ponds and marshes and such. Um, but it seems like in the winter, the adults tend to um, hibernate in vernal pools. And I, I think that the reason for that is because there's no particular reason why they would do that, except that the adults of this species are highly predatory. And one of the first places to truly come to life in the spring around here in our woods um, is the vernal pool habitat, which will have some of the earliest action of amphibian breeding. Wood frogs and spotted salamanders will breed sometimes as early as February, which means that it's the first habitat that is going to be filled with larvae and tadpoles. So even before there are bugs flying, which is usually the staple for most amphibians, um, these hibernating adult newts actually will have a, a ready supply of salamander eggs and tadpoles to, to munch on early on in the season. So I think they specifically seek out these vernal pool habitats just so, so that they wake up from winter and have a lot of food around. Salamanders play a really critical role in northeastern forest ecosystems. Um, salamanders are what we generally call cold-blooded, which more properly would be called ectothermic, meaning that they get their heat from an outside source, not internally. So um, it means that they don't waste any energy from the food that they eat trying to maintain a stable body temperature. So really all the energy that they consume from their food goes directly to growth. Um, because they're that small and because they don't need to sustain an internal combustion engine, they can actually survive on really teeny tiny little um, in invertebrates, the tiny little um, insects that live in the leaf litter mostly. And those, those insects would be so small that if a warm-blooded animal of the same size needed to survive on the same food source, it would need to eat so much of it to maintain its internal combustion engine and growth and everything like that that goes with life that it would have to eat so much it would be eating 24-7 pretty much. So when you think about the size constraints for warm-blooded animals, the smallest warm-blooded animals like a hummingbird, for example, they're eating nonstop just to feed, to feed their metabolism because they radiate out so much heat for a small body that they're losing heat, they need to maintain their high body temperature and all that. So the long and the short of it is that amphibians can survive on sizes of food that are really not feasible for warm-blooded animals to feed on. So what they're in essence doing is they're repackaging the energy from these teeny tiny creepy crawlies into a very energy efficient package of snack size salamander. So they form this really critical basis of the food web. So there's a lot of different animals that feed on salamanders that live in these woodlands that are sort of the accumulation of all this invertebrate energy sort of combined into a little amphibian body. Now, historically, um, in a healthy northeastern forest, an average acre of woodland by biomass or by, by weight should have more amphibian weight, more salamander weight than the small mammals and birds combined in the same forest. So by weight, woodland salamanders should be the most common vertebrate in, an, in an, any given area. So it's unfortunately not the case anymore, but you can see that how losing your salamanders would also remove a huge amount of biomass from a system. And if that's the biomass that makes the biomass that's below that on the food chain available to animals that are above it in the food chain, once you remove that middle layer from the food chain, the whole system comes crashing down. So all the animals that rely on salamanders for food would be lost from the same area of forest at that point. One of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now in terms of habitat management and habitat quality 
is that we're losing salamanders, which is easily done because people don't even see them. You have to truly look under logs and flip things to be able to see them. So there are these invisible components of the ecosystem that most people don't even realize are there and don't necessarily realize how important they are. One of the biggest threats that we're seeing these days is that invasive species like garlic mustard, for example, not only create problems because they're competing with native plants, but they're also changing the soil chemistry to the point that a forest where garlic mustard grows in substantial stands becomes unsuitable for woodland salamanders. So it's not even just habitat change, but it's invasive species too that can really do have a, have a major impact on a, on a normal northeastern forest, which will impact the salamanders and will trickle through the entire ecosystem at that point. There's a salamander. Okay. You see that? Yeah. And what kind is this? That, it looks like it. You'd expect it to be a redback salamander, and it kind of looks like that, but it's probably going to run like a lizard, which kind of means. Let me see. No, it is a redback salamander. Yeah. They come in different color phases. This one's actually more brown and red. Um, there's a stripe form that has sort of a reddish brown stripe and a kind of darker on the sides. And then there's one that's completely dark that lacks that kind of dark, that lighter stripe on the back, which is often referred to as like the leadback phase. Um, so these, these are the most common vertebrates in a healthy forest here. So by, by weight, these salamanders, like if you put all of them in an acre together, they should weigh more than all of the small mammals and all the birds in the same forest combined. Which is crazy when you think about it, because you barely see them. And they are, they're, they're gradually being replaced. By is this the species. one where there's a gluey sensation That's a it? different one. Okay. Yeah, that's a much bigger one. I'm hoping to find one, because they're really cool looking. They're like black with polka dots. So, so this salamander, it looks, it looks a lot like the redback salamander, but you can tell it's got like a little white stripe, like a little white mark, usually like below the eye, going to the corner of the mouth right there. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little chunkier. It's a little bit more uh, muscular than redback salamanders, especially the hind legs are really chunky compared to the front legs. Hold on one second, I'll show that. And um, this is a salamander that actually often lives in streams. There are two different kinds of it. This one is mostly found in woodlands close to the water, but then there's a different kind of northern dusky salamander that lives under rocks and streams and it's, it actually has these really strong legs so it can actually walk into the current sometimes. And if you ever try to catch adults of these, they get really squirmy. Like I've had them like actually in my hand. I've had them like in my hand where you can feel them just pushing their way out between your fingers. They're hmm. really, really powerful for a salamander. You can tell they're... You can tell they're really, really alert, very active yeah. compared to a redback salamander. There's a little wetter spot. Somebody's going down here. Where are you going? Uh, I want some more. Oh, there we go. So this is the adult Allegheny wow, that is long. dusky salamander. So the one that we just saw with the gold stripe on the back. And the chunky legs and the white stripe on the head, this is what they grow into. The less chunky legs. I know, but they get really fast. For a salamander, they're super fast. See, low. <laughs> Very squirmy. So this is a species that you find in like nice quality woodlands, like near water somewhere, not so much in the water. Um, really, most of our salamanders are woodland salamanders around here. So people often think that they're in the water, but the only one that truly lives in the water here is that the red spotted newt, so the, the aquatic phase of those orange Fs that we found before. We actually have a fully aquatic salamander here in Chautauqua County called a mud puppy, mm. which lives in streams and in lakes, and it's like a foot long, and it's what we call a neotenic salamander, so it actually retains its juvenile external gills, just like the larvae have the gills on the outside of their body. So, um, yeah, a few people often get them in their um, their docks in the pipes and um, 
So when you pull your dock into fall and you pull the pipes out, and then sometimes these like foot and a half long salamanders come out and they have these big bushy gills on the outside. And they're, so they're a good sized salamander, they're completely aquatic. They couldn't even survive on land because they have external gills and as soon as they get out of the water, it just kind of collapses and they can't breathe anymore. Hmm. Um, and they feed them crayfish and things like that. So there's some pretty interesting salamanders out here. But obviously you wouldn't find something like that out here. It needs a big body of water for that. Look, kid. Wow, it's a springy one. Yeah. Mm. It's like a jump worm. Yeah, I know, right? Like it is. Just... And what do we have here? This is a spring peeper. What's your hand doing? Well, spring is funny because it's spring now. It's pretty springy, isn't it? And it is spring. Yeah, it's spring yeah. now, so I guess it's spring. Yeah, and this looks like a little guy, so it's probably. What? Oh, oh. Here, let me hold it. It's probably a male. There he is. There we go. Now, what makes you say that? Just from size alone. <laughs> is that big or small? One? This is a small one first. They're, they're okay. small frogs anyway. So, so spring peepers are actually, they're very small tree frogs. Um, I think in this part of the county, we only really have this as the only tree frog we have. If you go a little bit farther east, you can find gray tree frogs as well. But for some reason, they're not here. Um, so this is our local tree frog. It's the spring peeper that you hear calling at night. And based on its size, it's got to be, you know, it's not a baby because it's too early for babies to come out. So it must be a male from last year. So this is probably one of the frogs that you can hear calling at night in the wetlands. And that's what they do. They come out early and they start calling and calling. And uh, they find the most ideal breeding site and then just sit on vegetation at night and advertise that. And then the females will hear it and they will actually gravitate towards the best calling male. The best singer gets, gets the girl in this case. Okay. Um, and it's, it's the females that choose the ideal male based on the quality of the call, which sort of is indicative of the best places to breed. Um, you know, the, the, the best, the strongest, the most fit males tend to sit in the places where they can project their calls the best, which tend to be exposed places where they're exposed to predators. So they're, it kind of indicates that these are like the toughest males, the best survivors. So those are the preferred ones to mate with. Okay. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. You can tell it's a spring peeper because it's <laughs> springy. <laughs> They're small and they have really tiny little sticky pads on their toes because they're tree frogs. But the most um, prominent feature on them is the fact that they have sort of a, an X-shaped mark, a darker mark on the back. It almost looks like somebody like put a little axe, a darker axe on them. That's like the most diagnostic field mark for them. Buzzing well. So the easier <laughs> to catch in water, I can say that. I know. It gets cold and it slows down. I think one of the things that I'm finding is that people in the area don't necessarily even realize how great the environment still is around here. You know, I, I moved here from uh, Connecticut seven, eight years ago, and I was the state conservation biologist for the Connecticut Audubon Society there. And I would manage 30 some different preserves, thousands of acres of anything from coastline to upland forest. You don't find this. You don't find forest that has an understory of native even wildflowers in most places in Connecticut and along most of the eastern seashore. Um, the understory has been decimated by deer and the only things that still grow are a few invasive species, some garlic mustard, Japanese barberry, the kind of things that deer even don't eat. So you walk into a forest along most of the east coast and you can just see for hundreds of yards because there's nothing growing there. So that, I think that was one of the things that always struck me when I first started coming out to this region that you just walk through a forest and you see native plants growing on the ground. It's such an incredible sensation. And it's its so easy to take for granted if you've never seen a forest that doesn't look like this. So I think it's its critically important for people like us to to communicate the value of this. It's easy to take for granted because that's just what a forest is supposed to look like in their backyards. But I can guarantee you that not too far from here, forests don't look like this and don't function like this. You know, when you start bringing in Lyme disease and ticks and all kinds of other things that we don't want. So having a forest, is not something we should ever take for granted. Having a healthy forest is certainly not something we should take for granted. So you know, learn what it's like, learn what a forest is supposed to look like and have a better understanding of what it should look like so that when it's changing, you can call in for backup. You can connect with the local professionals who can tell you if something might be happening there because it's critically important to have eyes out who's 
on these kind of habitats.